Okay. Thank you. So in three, two. Good afternoon. As chair, I now call to order the September 18th, 2023 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Baltimore, excuse me, of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as, as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Walsh, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you. Ms. Frimpong? Present. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Dr. Savoy? Ms. Stalusky? Present. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Uh, please call the roll to determine that which staff members are present in this meeting. Sure. Ms. Charlie Green. Dr. Raquel Jones. Present. Thank you. Mr. Homer McCall. Present. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pedro Agosto. Present. Thank you. Dr. Kimberly Ferguson. Present. Thank you. Ms. Bashira James. Present. Thank you. Ms. Bernadette Hunton. Present. Thanks. Ms. Boyende Onijala. Present. Thank you. Ms. Margaret Ann Howie. Here. Thank you. And Ms. Vicki Wash. Here. Thank you. Roll is complete. I'll pass it back over, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is item B1, policy 1100, communication with the public. Policy 1100 was returned to the committee by the board at the board's May 16th, 2023 meeting. Ms. Onijawa, please proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, thank you very much. Policy 1100 sets forth the board's vision for and commitment to engaging the Team BCPS community through effective communication across a variety of media and communication channels. We know that we can build community and build and bridge gaps through communication, and this policy underscores the importance of engaging all stakeholders to support student success and foster trust and confidence in the school system. Revision Provisions to this policy including, uh, include outlining updated practices regarding engaging with the community and communicating with the public. Um, it, it talks about the requirements for the superintendent to measure the effectiveness of communication practices, and it notes the system's commitment to engaging in multi-directional communication. Uh, so at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the revisions uh, that were also a reflection of uh, board member feedback um, and conversations regarding how we can strengthen uh, the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the recommended changes to policy 1100? Ms. Frempong? I just have a, a general question. So um, thank you for the update. So understanding that boundary study in particular has its own policy. Um, can you speak to how this policy or if it actually does address any communication regarding the boundary studies? So, for example, the announcements of the boundary study, selection of the committee participants and public survey. 
Thank you, Ms. Frempong, for that question. What I can um, speak to as it relates to this policy and the work around the boundary study and other system uh, initiatives, programs, um, meetings that require community engagement and specific school uh, community engagement. What this policy discusses is our efforts to use multiple methods to get the word out. So as it relates to the boundary study, what that would look like with within the realms of this policy would be getting it out in multiple languages, utilizing school messenger emails, text messages, phone calls, our press releases, putting it up on our website as a slider, utilizing all of our social media platforms, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So what this policy speaks to really is that effort to tap into all of the methods that are available to us to ensure that the community is aware of uh, system events, important important meetings, uh, things where we want the system to uh, community to join us in efforts. Um, and so I think what you'll see here in this policy is outlining that kind of multidimensional, multidirectional communication, ensuring that all families are aware of this. And turn my mic back on, sorry, thank you. So as a follow up to that, what about uh, any partnerships with, for example, community organizations? Yes, so that work uh, really lives with our family and community engagement team. And so what that would look like is partnering with the PTA, uh, again, to share this communication, to share this information. If we're still speaking specifically to the boundary study, uh, reaching out to uh, community associations, gov local government agencies, really tapping into our partner network, uh, once again, to ensure that you know we're reaching everyone who could potentially help us share the information about the important system work. Fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. Ms. Stelsky, do you have a question? Um, yes, thank you. And thank you for the update. And my question may be something that's been answered. So I'm sorry for that. Um, but just with being a new member, I'm not sure what the policy is. So with all of the um, communication mediums to, to reach out, which I really want to compliment you on all of your efforts, it really is amazing. For families that may not be able to connect via text message, email, um, the internet, is there a way or has there been a way to survey families so that if they are not getting the outreach, that maybe we have a more person-to-person -person approach with that particular family to make sure that every family is getting the communications? And thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Ms. Dolsky. And I think we alluded a little bit to this at the last board meeting where we talked about a lot of the grassroots work that's happening, parent chats, parent coffees, uh, focus groups, working with our um, our partners such as Comite Latino, where we're really targeting um, and reaching into those communities that we know may not be as plugged into Facebook and other social media platforms. Maybe they're not utilizing email as much. And so what we are now relying on is as we tap into these partner networks and we host parent nights and we have the parent mobile going out to community centers and community events, they're getting that face to face engagement. Now, you know, our desire is to reach everyone. We know it's it's not always possible, but by, you know, getting ourselves out there, utilizing the parent mobile uh, van, by holding coffees, by working with some of these grassroots organizations that are doing advocacy work, we're able to reach more people uh, than we typically would have if just, we were just relying on our, uh, our technology to do so, on emails, on social media posts. So I think we've actually seen an increase in that engagement by leveraging some of these community groups by joining in on their parent chats, by joining in on those family nights when they just have gatherings, right, in, about an co important community topic. We're now able to connect more deeply with those families who may not be as engaged with email and social media and our website. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, it does. And I think it's great that you're seeing positive results. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to track, you know, of course, we would all be concerned if there are families that just feel whether it's a language barrier yes. or that they're just not getting any outreach at all. And I don't know if there's a way maybe through some of the community schools um, in particular for there to be some way to survey or um, 
assess that parents feel that they're able to get some communication. Yes. And I and again, I, I, thank you so much. Absolutely. And I just also forgot to add that in these conversations, which we are tracking, which I mentioned at our last board meeting, the number of like focus groups that we're having and parent nights that we're participating in, there is an informal surveying of families to say, how can we better meet your needs in terms of communication? And we're getting that feedback to say, we really appreciate phone calls from our principals because it comes directly to our phone, right? They look to their schools as the primary source of information, which I believe I shared with the board as a result of our initial questionnaire. But we are doing that informal surveying to learn more about the ways that families want us to engage with them, not what we are assuming they want, but what they're telling us directly that they want from the school system in the space that they're already in having conversations about important topics. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And excuse me, Ms. Pumphrey, just so you're aware, Ms. Harvey has joined by phone. OK, thank you. Are there any other questions or discussion? OK, thank you very much, Ms. Onidala. That was very helpful. I appreciate you. Um, next on our agenda is item B. Oh, I'm sorry. Something. Excuse me. Yes, um, sorry about that. <laughs> What's the committee's pleasure with respect to policy 1110? That, thank you, Ms. Howie. If there are no corrections and no objection, policy 1100 is 1100, yes, is moved forward for a second reader as presented. Board member um, Pumphrey, this is board member from Pong speaking. I yes, have one more follow up as a one more follow up question, I guess. Um, cool. You mentioned um, about the different ways that you're reaching out and doing the survey. Are you guys as communications, are you able to track, um, I guess, how effective that is or where that information is coming from? So for example, if people are showing up at an event or uh, responding to a survey, are, are you guys capturing the information to say, the parent said, I got this because of, you know, the parent mobile that came or because of the email that got sent, et cetera? So in some spaces, we are doing that. For example, with the communications questionnaire that went out, we were able to track like who opened it, who completed the survey, and knew that we had 3,000 plus responses to that. Uh, when the team is out during these uh, parent nights or out with the parent mobile, we're gathering information about how they learned about these resources. I wouldn't say that we're doing it in all you know avenues and all at all events, but it's certainly something that we can look into how we can build that into our practices. For example, the meet the superintendent events. You know, as you are submitting your question or feedback, and you check a little box to say you saw the school messenger announcement, you got the text message. You saw it on social media. I think that's what you're speaking um, about, and we can certainly look into um, building that into part of our process for more of these large system events and initiatives as well to to capture that. Thank you, and thank you for all Absolutely. your work. You guys have been doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, if there are no corrections and no objections, policy 1100 is moved forward for a second reader as presented. Thank you. Item B2, policy 4100, employee conduct and responsibilities. Um, policy 4100 was returned to a committee by the board at the board's May 16th, 2023 meeting. Um, Ms. Bernadette Hunt Hunton will present this policy. When you're ready, Ms. Hunton, you may proceed. Good afternoon, board members, and thank you. Policy 4100 establishes that professionalism and general decorum comprise the board's standards of acceptable behavior. Staff is recommending the following changes. Number one, um, edits to conform to the Policy Review Committee editing conventions. Number two, including a hyperlink to the implementing rule. And number three, based on first reader comments, clarifying the language of expected standards of behavior, specifically to identify what they are. With regard to number three, um, if I can draw your attention to the proposed language in section 1B, the standards of behavior to act ethically, to exhibit a strong work ethic, to work productively and perform duties in a professional manner are already embedded in the policy at 1B. However, the existing language does not clearly identify them as such. And so therefore we have added language to 1B 
to clarify that these are the standards of behavior that we are referring to in the policy. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hutton. Is Hunton, excuse me, is there any discussion on the recommended changes to policy 4100 or questions? Ms. Frumpong? Hi, uh, this is board member Frumpong. So uh, my question is related to the, um, I guess is ethically or ethics, are they defined for BCPS employees? I was trying to do a search in policies and I saw for 4002 as employees of the board there um, is reference and then there's 8360, 8361 um, and other 8000, but that relates to board members. So specifically then for BCPS employees, do we have language explaining or dictating like what does that mean ethics or ethically behaving? So uh, Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Hunton, if you don't mind, uh, I'll start and you can finish. Um, board member Frempong, uh, board policy series 8360 is your code of ethics and it's not just for board members, it's for all school system employees. So we are all required to follow the code of ethics that the board has that are modeled on state regulation and state law. So those are specifically embedded, if you will, in uh, board policy 80 or in the 8360 series. Okay, makes sense now, thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, if there are no corrections and no objection, policy 4100 is moved forward for second reader as presented. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. you Hunton. board members. May Ms. Hunton, Ms. James, and Mr. McCall be excused. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is item B3, policy 5200, promotion and retention. Policy 5200 was returned to the committee by the board on May 16th. And for this item, we call on, Ms. on Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson, when you're ready, you may proceed. Good afternoon, um, policy and review committee members. I am bringing back to you policy 5200, which outlines the board's responsibility to establish guidelines for promotion and retention of our students here in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, this particular policy is uh, related to uh, focus area one in our compass um, as we prepare students for college and career readiness. This particular policy promotes the belief that Baltimore County Public Schools will be among the highest performance school system in the nation as a result of raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing every student for the future. Through the process of identifying and disrupting performance resulting in potential for retention, students can receive interventions to support promotion throughout their academic career, resulting in in identifying their opportunities for college and career readiness. The last time we came before you, we specifically um, noted that we had made changes related to, um, to uh, minor stylistic changes to the policy to reflect more clearly the board's commitment to equitable outcomes for all students. We also inserted a new section implementing rule and placed a hyperlink to the superintendent's rule in uh, board docs um, as a result of the public works recommendation. Um, and specifically as a result of your, your uh, comments on May 16th, we also added language to more clearly define the role and input of parents in the placement, promotion, and retention of their children um, this policy will, um, the impact on this particular policy will provide guidance for efficient operations of the promotion and retention processes for our students. And that is policy 5200. Are there any questions? 
Just a quick comment. Um, I appreciate that we um, that you're suggesting to add a parent um, involvement. I think just even though it's it was intended, I think specifically stating that is important um, to our based on public comment that we've heard. So I appreciate that. Welcome. Um, do we have any other questions or discussion? Uh, Ms. Stolesky, I think I saw your hand first. Hi, thank you for the presentation and thank you to the committee, you know, for all the work that you've already done. Um, this might sound a little bit um, a bit far fetched, but I know um, there was concern understandably at the last board meeting about students being promoted that are at um, reading levels that are so far below. Um, I'm sorry, students are being uh, permitted to graduate from high school when their reading levels are so far below what would be reasonable for them to succeed in society. So I didn't know if it was something to consider, and this is just sort of a thought that I had about a possible like maybe a five year plan or putting something in place to ensure that when students do graduate from high school that they are at a reasonable um, reading grading level reading grade level, excuse me. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. You're asking that in the promotion and retention guidelines, we add additional language around students being on grade level for reading? No, not necessarily in the in the guidelines at all. It was just something, you know, that certainly there is a great deal of concern about um, that students are graduating from high school and their uh, reading ability is so far below what would enable them to succeed. So I just didn't know if that was something that we all wanted to look into to possibly put something in place for possibly a five year plan or something in the future to make sure that we're addressing this need. So uh, Ms. Tulesky, if you would allow me to speak with Dr. Ferguson sure. and Dr. Jones. Sure. Um, and we can discuss your concern and how to frame it so that PRC um, can see whether or not there is a specific place in a policy where such um, a desire might go. But that we're happy sense. to look at that and come back to you with um, with some suggestions. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ms. Frempong, did you also have a question? Yes, so um, I guess it's an overall question as far as are these edits enough to address those concerns from parents um, who do not believe that the child should be promoted to the next grade level? I think we've heard definitely concerns as far as with special education, but uh, general education as well. So if the addition of parents being involved in this process for their promotion and retention, um, I guess is that enough to make sure that we're addressing those concerns from the parents? So the the actual guidelines are really addressed in the rule where parents are required to meet with well, school administrators are required to meet with parents before recommending uh, a retention for any student. So those guidelines, the specific language to sorry, my lights going out. Uh, and well, there you go. Um, the guidelines related to specific to what parents um, how they'll be notified on a quarterly basis when students aren't making progress that's spelled out in the rule as well as the required conferences um, before a student is retained um, or if a, if a parent and there are some cases where parents don't want their their students are supposed to be promoted and they don't want their students promoted those conversations are held as well OK, great. So it sounds like it was in the rule. We just didn't have it captured as far as parental involvement in the, the policy itself. In the policy, the language in the policy has been included. Um, it was updated to include the statement that parents would be involved in the decision making, and that right. is in the policy. How that how that um, looks is spelled out in the rule. Perfect. OK, thank you. Um, 
Ms. Howie, just referring back to Ms. Zaleski's question um, and your response, is is that um, your response, is that regarding this particular policy or are you, um, or did you, are you um, referring to maybe a different policy altogether? So I do believe based on what's been stated that it may be part of a different policy. Okay. Uh, so the the frame that the picture will come back to you in may not be policy 5200. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions or comments on policy 5200? Okay, hearing none, if there are no corrections and no objections, policy 5200 is moved forward for second reader as presented. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. May Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Jones be excused? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item C1, policy 8138, administration and policy absence. Uh, for this, we call on Ms. Howie. Ms. Howie, when, you, when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you. Good evening, committee members. I'm here to present policy 8131, asking that the committee uh, accept staff's recommendation that this policy be readopted. The policy is titled Administration and Policy Absence. It was amended in 2016 to include, interestingly enough, implementation language, which is in section two. Prior to that, it was amended in 2012 to change its title. But the concept has remained unchanged since the policy was first written in 1968, which was before my time. Uh, the policy basically indicates what you expect as members of the board, and that is that your superintendent, in the absence of a policy, will move forward to take action. What that action looks like is going to depend on the specific situation. In looking at the history of the policy to determine whether or not this had ever happened, uh, whether or not the superintendent ever acted in the absence of policy. There was not a specific instance. However, uh, in looking as well at uh, what your sister jurisdictions do, uh, like our um, sister school systems, we've also included in the policy that when the superintendent essentially implements a policy without a policy being present, that the superintendent is required to report to the board at the earliest available opportunity, actually it's the next regular board meeting, that uh, the superintendent has acted and that a policy should be um, implemented or considered by the board. Um, we are not recommending, as I indicated, any changes to the policy. We believe that the concepts um, have remained unchanged since 2007, uh, so we believe that in its current form it should be readopted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howie. So just to clarify, so this would mean if if something were to happen and the superintendent had to make a decision on something and move forward at the next board meeting, she would um, describe what, what decisions she had to make and then um, request that a policy be made in accordance with that decision since a policy didn't already exist, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions or discussions? Items? Ms. Rumbong? Um, just going to say thank you, Ms. Howie. I anticipated my question because that was my question was going to be have this ever happened before and to give an example of that because it's it was very interesting to hear about something like this potentially happening. So thank you for the research and answering my question in advance. Surely. Okay, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, if there are no corrections and no objection, policy 8138 is moved forward for first reader as presented. Thank you, committee members, and I won't ask to be excused. I will stay. <laughs> Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item D, presentation on artificial intelligence. The board has requested that the committee discuss artificial intelligence to determine whether the board's policies address it. Um, and for this, we call on Mr. Augusto. Um, yes, it says Miss, but I know you're Mr. So thank you, Mr. Augusto. Please proceed when you're ready. 
All right. Good evening, board, our committee members. Um, and okay, great. The slide is up. So yes, I want to take this opportunity in preparation or anticipation for discussions on how to handle AI, generative AI in particular. Um, I just put together a short slide just to talk about what AI, some considerations um, that school districts should think about and then open it up to questions. So next slide, please. So in today's rapidly evolving technology, technological landscape, so AI's burst into the system um, from chat GPT's initial rollout in November of uh, 2022. It's, you know, it's really um, hit the public mindset. And there are various tools now out there. We'll talk about that. But I think it now bears um, some time to discuss um, how Baltimore County Public Schools should recognize the significance of AI. Uh, there are benefits Although we'll talk about some of the risks, there are some benefits um, that I believe outweigh the risks, and especially in fostering innovation and preparing students for the future. Next slide, please. So first we'll talk about what is generative AI. So I think everybody's heard about ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is just one of many tools that are out there. So the the more general term when you hear gen ai or uh, in particular uh, the difference between ai and gen ai so if you just think of um, artificial intelligence as um, there's a bunch of smart people that put that pull data together in um, a data platform that uh, can be used by these programs that they write these chatbots you hear about um, to extract data based on the questions that are being provided. So in generative AI, the difference is the algorithms, the programs that are using it learn from the additional data being put in, the questions being asked, and the responses that are generated from those questions. So it, it gets smarter and learns to provide um, answers to questions that have a higher reliability rate. Now, <clears throat> there are various types of generative AI. The first one is foundation models. So think of it this way as a, um, a prefab house. It's, it's created, it has a set purpose. So in this case, uh, people pull together large amounts of data for a particular sector, whether it could be healthcare, um, automated vehicle uh, driving, all of these have certain commonalities. Uh, all of this is put together. The benefit to that is if someone wants to create an AI chatbot, they can leverage all of this data that's been pulled together and not have to create one from scratch. The next item is the large language model, which ChatGPT Chat GPT is one. In this case, again, you just ingest a lot of text-based information, whether it's books, uh, reports, all of this information is pulled in and then the AI engine is trained on how to analyze that data and return responses. So in this case, your chatbot, whether it's ChatGPT, whether it's Google Bard, um, Bing's chatbot, you're allowed to use um, just native um, regular language to put in um, a request and it generates uh, the information. And it's pretty robust, right? It's pretty uh, complex in what it can return. It can return um, stories based on the parameters you give it. Um, there are now um, graphic AI engines that can generate um, digital art for you. Um, you know, a lot of people have used the example of creating a poem based on information you've given it. So <clears throat> the, the, the point to, men to mention here is that AI engines will get smarter as more and more data is ingested and as more and more questions are asked of it because it will just continuously learn from the additional amount of information that's given. Next slide, please. So how should K-12 districts respond to AI? So what I've done here is I just 
listed out some considerations. I think the one that everybody is familiar with and, and people talk about is the misuse of AI tools, right? So how do you combat, or there's the issue of plagiarism, there's the issue of cheating um, as coursework is given. Um, that is something we'll talk about, you know, governance and policies and guidelines, but, you know, it, there is a risk out there. Um, but I believe it can be <clears throat> um, compensated by the use of AI detection software that's out there. Uh, Google has one. Um, we're currently investigating how to use that for um, internally at BCPS. Uh, there are other um, tools out there in the marketplace. Uh, Turnitin, I believe, is one. Um, um, Watson. AI, I think the same of it's another. So there, there are tools out there. The one thing to note about AI detection tools, as is also the case with AI in general, is um, they're not 100% reliable. So you will get, may possibly get situations of false positives um, with the AI detection tools. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the risks associated with the return of information that you get back from. Um, questions that you may pose of an AI engine. Another consideration is the lack of, and I'll say AI appropriate governance policies and guidelines here. It is an emerging, emerging technology. Um, there may be some considerations as to the particular flavor here that um, AI being implemented into the environment will cause. However, uh, what I'll state here, my opinion is we also have um, policies um, in place today that, that kind of overarch this. So the acceptable use policy uh, talks about the use of technology. There's the student code of conduct. So that can be leveraged. So um, you're not starting from a blank slate. Um, and, and I'll talk about what some districts have um, opted to do in terms of the acceptable use policies. Uh, the other consideration is um, the training program, not only for students on how to use AI, but also for staff. I think there's a big opportunity here and uh, lesson planning to be able to use um, the AI chatbots to help create um, learning content uh, for courses that can be done. Um, ISTE, who's one of the um, um, institution or instructional tech um, organizations out there, has actually put together some PD for how to define or how to create lesson plans using AI. Um, the other one is equity and accessibility. Now, simply because we uh, which, as we do today, so we do block chat DPC, chat GPT on our um, student or uh, BCPS devices on our network. However, um, chat GPT is an open source application. It's, it's out there. Bing uh, can be used by anyone. So there is the issue of equity and accessibility should um, there be the use of it outside of, of what we provide to students as well, which is a consideration. We should think about that. Um, the other is the use of AI in the job market. And I'll um, provide some um, statistics I have here. And this is from a Gartner study that was um, provided back in June of, um, or sorry, January of uh, 2022. So, <clears throat> Just a little bit of some nuggets here. By 30 percent, or by 2025, 30 percent of enterprises will have implemented an AI augmented development and testing strategy, and that's up from only 5 percent in 2021. And they feel that by 2026, that uh, generative design AI will automate 16 per 60 percent of the design effort for new websites and mobile applications. There is, uh, for folks that want to go into the technical field, AI is the future. And I think we would do our, our students a disservice by not providing that, um, um, that level of instruction. I know we, we have put together our own um, BCPS uh, AI 
um, curriculum that we do have, which is great. And that's the step forward I think we need to do to make sure that our students are prepared for the job market of the future. And then the last one I have here, um, and then I'll talk about a couple more, so the AI hallucinations. I'll talk about what that is. As I mentioned before, AI is not foolproof. So there's this concept, there's this uh, idea of hallucination. So you can, you can put in a request, AI will generate a response and it will reference uh, some source that doesn't exist. And it, it happens periodically. So this is, is part of consideration, as I mentioned, as students and staff use AI to realize there are limitations to the tool and it should not be used blindly. So there should be cross-reference of, um, of resources or, or references that are made uh, throughout the tool. Just as people learned with um, using social media and then using the internet for research purposes that um, just because it's out there doesn't mean it's true so that same holds for for ai um, there are also some additional risks that i'll talk about um, with ai and that is um, i talked about the factual inaccuracies um, there's also, again, going back to the reliability of the engine, the engine is only going to be as good as the data that's provided. So ChatGPT, the last refresh um, that I have was September of 2021. So you, you are dealing with outdated data um, that will periodically refresh itself as the um, providers uh, give more information. There are um, data privacy concerns and considerations that need to be thought of. That is, um, for example, if you're using Chat GPT, you log in, you have to register. So in that case, you're providing name, email address, um, and then there's no assurance that there's third parties that out there that may be able to use that information, or service providers, affiliates, uh, to to use the information that's out there. Um, there's also the concern that all of the data that has been captured, uh, the information that people provide when they do um, searches or, or ask these AI engines uh, to provide responses. All of that information is out there. It can be accessed by hackers. So there's these are considerations to think of as we're using um, AI, but I, I believe these are not um, limitations that can't be overcome. Um, next slide, please. And then, so what are districts doing? So what I did is just pulled uh, a few of the largest districts in the country. New York City is, is very public because it initially banned ChatGPT, but as of May of this year, um, they they have allowed the use of ChatGPT. LA Unified, they currently ban ChatGPT, but um, in August, to the start of this school year, they implemented their own chatbot called Ed, which is another use of AI technology in the customer service sector. So they've, they've uh, created a chatbot that allows parents to be able to pull information, uh, get students grades, get other uh, class information, just a lot of the information that's captured by LA Unified. It's been pulled, consolidated, and this chatbot is able to reference it. Chicago Public Schools, this is what I mentioned. They haven't made a position either way. What they've done is they just refer stakeholders to the district's acceptable use policy. <clears throat> excuse me, policy. So they're stating, look, um, chat GPT is no different than any other emerging technology. We've put together a policy and we're referring mm -hmm. uh, people to that policy. Charlotte Mecklenburg, again, they restricted uh, chat GPT to only staff as well as Fulton County. Uh, they prohibited chat GPT on student devices, which kind of mirrors the approach that we currently have. So these are what other districts are doing. However, I do see, and um, the industry does see the relaxing of these bands as is typical uh, when a new technology comes out. People want to take a slow and measured approach. 
be conservative. Let's understand what the technology is and figure out how to accommodate that technology within the school district. Next slide, please. All right, and at this point, um, I'll open up to any questions you might have about AI um, impact that I've seen in other districts or any questions you might have. OK, so first let's take questions and then I just have a few discussion items myself also, but we'll go with questions first. And I think I saw Ms. Teleski's <laughs> hand first. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and all of the research that you have certainly done. Um, I I personally agree with you that a little bit of a conservative approach is prudent just to make sure that we're not making decisions too quickly and then we don't have procedures and policies in place. Um, I'd be very curious just specifically with the New York district that initially banned but now is allowing it. Um, what their evaluation of how things are going yes. are so that we can certainly, as we plan for this, use that as a learning tool. And so what I can, yeah, New what York I can, and not Newark, New Jersey, Ms. Uh, Ms. Teleski. Oh, it's New York City. New York oh, City. sorry, I thought I said New York. Thank you. Um, what I can say about New York City is, uh, so the person did, so in, as I mentioned, um, immediately after the release of ChatGPT, they made they they had the position that they were banning it. Now, what they did in that interim between uh, November and May, so November 2022 to May of 2023, is they convened uh, committees uh, to evaluate the use of the tool, evaluate the pros and cons, and start formulating. Uh, what their governance policies would be around it. So again, they took the time to to discuss it internally and bring in stakeholders to to better understand how they would do it. And then they then came to the decision that um, in May of 2023 that they were they felt comfortable and confident that they could rescind that ban and and be able to manage it. So um, what I can do is um, pull together any additional information I have specifically about um, policy or um, guideline changes that they have made uh, to accommodate um, AI in their district. And Ms. Teleski, I'm sorry, Ms. Teleski, uh, you do have the summary prepared by um, law office staff uh, that does have links to um, the before and after for New okay. York City. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey, I think you also had a question. I did. Thank you. I'm just wondering, and it may be in the notes as well. Uh, for me, this is, you know, a, a generational issue that is inevitable. AI is just going to be with us. It reminds me of when Cliff Notes came out and, and all the controversy about could students use Cliff Notes, you know, to write their essays and where they copy it straight from the Cliff Notes and all of that stuff. So what do you, and, it's, and I feel like the concern is mainly are students going to substitute their own critical thinking for AI generated thoughts? Mm -hmm. So what is the what do you see as the legitimate uses as we you know wade into this area? What do you see from a student perspective what the legitimate uses of AI would be for students? Yeah, so <clears throat> let me start by saying that I can't necessarily speak to uh, the pedagogy around this, but I can I can tell you from what I've seen. Um, and actually I was in a conference um in june and um there was a teacher talking about how he was using uh chat gpt in his class and um, the scenario he gave is that he <clears throat> he had his class the the objective was they were they were to write a play so as a class um as a whole he used he opened up chat gpt he uh, based on input from the class, what the subject matter for this play would be. Um, 
they generated the first act of the play. And then as teams, they went ahead and broke off into teams. They discussed what they wanted to do for the subsequent acts of the play. And they, as a project, um, as a team, created the subsequent acts. So um, again, that's, that's one example. I, I found that um, interesting and kind of creative way of using ChatGPT. Um, the other thing um, and, and how it can be used um, for course um, content and curriculum is I, I saw in some of the research I did where um, the use of so chat GPT or generative AI would be used as a tool um, and then what can be used as uh, performance indicators would be, well, how are they using the tool as, as you would any kind of reference material? How are they taking the base information that they provided to create the final um, the final deliverable, right? The, uh, whether it's, it's an essay or whether it is something else. Um, so it's, again, so I'll stop there because I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm on the IT side, but there are ways, it's, it is gonna require thinking outside of standard pedagogy to figure out how you can use this in the classroom. And then just as a follow-up, you mentioned in your presentation that there were there was AI detection software. That's correct. Uh, that it's not, of course, foolproof, but is does that mean that uh, the software would be able to tell if a, a product was generated through AI or if just if AI is in use on your device? No, it, it actually, <clears throat> so for example, if, if you write a report and that report's been submitted, the tool will actually ingest that report and it has its own AI as well. And it runs through its algorithm and determines the probability that this was generated through AI. So the question is, so the tool itself, right, this technology, it's gonna give you its probability score that um, it was generated through AI. At that point, um, you have to determine what do you do with that information? So what's going to be the process and protocol for if you, if you get a hit right on a report what should the teacher do in that case so that needs to be fleshed out but yes so the the tools that are out there themselves are are ai tools themselves that just read in information and generate the probability that this was generated from ai thank you thank you very much and miss harvey on page one of the uh the spreadsheet there's a reference there's reference to a washington post article about false allegations and how students respond to false allegations based on the um, the false positives from some of these detection tools. Thank you, Mr. Augusto. May I uh, add uh, one one bit? Uh, so yes, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey, the the um, the tool that uh, we're investigating in, in BCPS also has a uh, a nice feature where the um, the detection software is presented to the student. Uh, that they can use for three times prior to turning in their assignment so that it is a uh, methodology that they can also look at their own work before they are hand handing it into the teacher so that there is a ability for them to um, edit the work prior to turning it in for a final copy. So not just a uh, kind of a, 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 a summative uh, ass assessment, but more of a formative model so that students have and and it is limited to three opportunities so that they can check their work, make edits, check their work again, make edits, check the work a third and final time prior to turn in. So it gives our students that kind of agency to be able to manage this as you reference this new generational piece of how do I how do I adapt my work with uh, with this availability. Thank you. Um, so I think that we are um, uh, sort of addressing a couple different areas with this. Um, one is, as Mr. Augusto said, this is just this is the future, so I don't think it's something that we can ignore. Technology is ever changing. Um, and I think that um, as a system, if we're ahead of the game with this, 
you know, it's better. Even, you know, if some systems are sort of pausing and holding, I appreciate the fact that we're looking into this already and addressing the dif different circumstances. And then, of course, we have the other side of this as far as misuse, um, which I think some of our policies, you know, specifically our, our acceptable use policy is already addressing. But I think the question is, do we need to get uh, more specific with the policy or is it, you know, is it, does it cover in general what we're looking at here? Um, and I do think that we we certainly need to um, we certainly need to instruct and train our students and teachers as far as um, the use. My concern, which I never thought about until this was brought up today, is the equity and accessibility part, portion of this, because if we aren't allowing students to access this on BCPS devices, that means that some students have access to it and others don't. So um, I think that's something that we certainly need to address in a timely fashion to be sure that there's equitable equitable use throughout the system for students who their only access is we need to think about. Um, so I think our next question here is just based on our discussion, and I think we've sort of um, answered this already, um, is if the committee uh, wishes to move further with review of this. I think we should. I, I think it's going to land with us as, um, you know, generating this policy, so. Think we might, since we, oh, sorry. No, I was just saying since we started down this road, we should probably see it to the to the yeah, end. Yeah, I, I feel like we've, we're already starting to, to discuss it, but um, it seems like sort of two different issues here that we're addressing, I think, at least two, you know, as far as um, acceptable use and as far as just the actual implementation and of the policy and also training our teachers and students how to, how to use the technology. So there's two different angles here that I don't think we were looking at it initially that way when it was brought forward, but now we are, in my opinion. Ms. Frembong, did you also have a question or a statement? I did, I guess just, and I understand that you don't have the answer right now, but more so from a financial aspect, I guess I was just trying to understand what's the magnitude as far as the cost of these tools, uh, potential training. Is this like on a subscription type of basis typically for these tools? How does that work and what's you know, just in general, is the, the financial impact. So let me talk about, and Jim, you can chime in if you need. So the um, Google's tool is part of our um, enterprise license. So, um, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 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 a sunk cost for us, right? We're we're paying for the entire site license, which includes this product. That That's is correct. correct. Okay. Yeah, now in terms of training, um, yes, it, it would be, uh, I, I think, the, the same process we do in researching any PD content. We'd see if there is content that you can buy versus content that you can build in-house and then figure out the associated costs with that. Thank you. And I think it would be helpful, which we did address this somewhat, but maybe more in depth for um, staff to address or get, provide us with advice as far as how our current policy, um, you know, has overarching effect on anything to do with AI. And if it might be suggested that we add any more specific language or if it's clear enough with the um, already present policy as far as acceptable use. Any other questions or discussion? I don't see anything else, so I think we can move forward. Um, as far as this uh, discussion, Ms. Howie, is that all we need to do at this point? Will, will staff come back to us with some additional information in the future or suggestions as far as the policy is concerned? Yes, we'll be back, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> thank you. So may Mr. Augusto be excused, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Augusto, for that presentation. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Take care. OK, so now um, our last item is just committee general good and welfare. And so the floor is open to members to the committee of the committee to discuss issues of concern. 
I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as far as the open meeting, open speeding act. Any other discussion at this point, Ms. Frempong? I just had a quick question because I did go back into board docs. So this presentation that was given, where is the link to that? Because I just saw the spreadsheet and a 71 page PDF, but I didn't find the presentation that we just saw. So the uh, I can send you the um, the slide deck. That was what that Mr. Augusto presented today. I'm happy to do that or put that as one of the exhibits in board docs, whichever the committee prefers. OK, thank you. If um, if other board members that aren't part of this committee were to come or anybody actually in general, the public were to come back and watch this actual um, committee meeting, will they see the presentation throughout that throughout the video? If they go back and watch. I'm not sure I'll have to ask Mr. Corns. Mr. Corns uh, does that video um, display. I thought it was just audio. Uh, Ms. Howie, um, the, the video uh, display uh, that will go out will be uh, only the slide deck that was seen with the voiceover. Does okay. that answer the question? Yes, sir. Yeah, that does. Does. I just think it might be helpful for other board members um, who had brought who wanted a presentation about this to be able to see that presentation sure. prior to our Please. board meeting to know what we discussed. Thank absolutely. you, Ms. Pumphrey. It absolutely is just the slide deck that I showed. So it, it, with uh, all the discussion underneath, so it would be a representation of that slide deck. Yep. OK, thank you. Anything else? OK, so um, the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for Monday, October 16th at 4.30 p.m. And because there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, members. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for including me in the